Josh, right? Yes, sir. I'm so bad at names. I go by Josh Lee and the original Josh as well. Okay, so you've been with Dirt Killer, Atlantic Pressure Washers, Krenzley USA. There's a bunch of companies here you guys have. Yes, sir. But we're, we're going to call it Krenzley USA as long as I'm here. So for how many years? Uh, yesterday was my 13th anniversary. Okay, so you've seen Lucky every, 13. everything there is to see with these. I have. And I want to know everything there is to know. Okay. Right. So I know enough to be dangerous, um, but uh, but I want to get definitive from the source information. You've seen every possible issue. How many, this is what, a couple year old machine probably? What do you think? Um, Did they? FD, FE, so these, this was built yet last year. Okay, so this is probably a year old machine. Mm -hmm. So what I, what I want to do first is show people how to change the oil and then we'll start digging into some of the more complicated things uh, and, and talk about changing unloaders and gauges and, and all of that stuff. So the first thing I noticed is I had an issue with mine. Like, not an issue, but I couldn't get this off. Right. I noticed, have you cheated here? Have you done something to this I to did. make it easier I to get it? I did cheat. Okay, so um, how do we cheat? So, well, the Germans designed this. The slot that's in the top of this oil cap uh -huh. is just the size for an, a Euro coin. Yeah, right. So you put yep. your Euro coin down in there, and that's supposed to help you. But you got to have a gosh loose. darn iron grip to mm. still to get it off. Yes. So basically, the first one you're just going to ruin. No, no, I use a nice heavy duty flat tip screwdriver, mm -hmm. and the trick push, push applying enough pressure as you break it loose. Okay. Now. From factory, you find that it's tighter and harder to get loose than after you've removed it a handful of times. Okay. So, now there is usually some pressure inside the transmission housing okay. after the machine has been operated, both from uh, expansion due to heat and breakdown of the oil. Okay. So, it's wise to use a little bit of caution as you're removing the plug so that you don't get then squirted with oil. So, why, why do we lay these down? There's no oil pump in these, right? That's right. So the oil in the transmission housing is uh, an oil bath for the <clears throat> for the plungers and the uh, wobble or swash plate assembly that's in the back end that transfers motion from the rotation of the motor to the in and out motion of the plungers okay. inside of the, the valve we'll housing. We'll show that later when we take one of these things apart and we and have a cutaway. And we have a cutaway. Kind of yeah. look at. So the pl there's plungers and a plate in here, basically. Right. And so where does the oil sit? Does it sit on the bottom when you turn it over? No, inside the transmission housing, which uh -huh. we can look at, an, at one here in a little while. Um, inside the transmission housing, it's probably, it's, it's a relatively small reservoir. It holds approximately a third of a uh, quart of oil. Okay. Or a third of, yeah, I think it's a third of a quart. Okay. Um, and it's just a bath. Okay. Now, the reason for laying it down flat is so that the transmission of heat between the oil bath and the water passing through the pump, uh -huh. the water that passes through the pump cools the valve housing uh -huh. and the solid plungers that go back and forth between the transmission and the valve housing, okay. uh, that transmits heat from the oil bath to the, the valve housing. So it helps to carry the, the flow of heat out of the machine to keep the pump cooler, which in pressure washers that run the entire time that it's turned on, mm -hmm. um, it can get quite hot. With this one, of course, you know, the 1122 and the 1322 have the pressure switch shut down. So, so if you run it standing up, it's not that it's not getting oil, it's that it's running too hot. Yes, it's not transmitting the heat properly between the transmission housing and the valve housing to expel that heat. Because I've had some guys that didn't know that and they ran it for years and years and years standing straight up. Yeah. Which is just bad, right? Right. Uh, there's also some lubrication ports on the back end of the trend of the face plate uh -huh. that keep the oil seals lubricated. Okay. So if you run it standing up, that can also cause uh, overheating of the oil seals, which can cause them to fail. Got it. Okay. All right. So we take the plug. So are all of them like if I open up this box, it doesn't come out that easy. No. So it's going to be a little snug. Got it. So even uh, mine was so snug that I couldn't. Like I had a channel lock and I just ruined it. Yeah. The, now mine is nine years old. I find that an older flat tip screwdriver that the tip is snapped off of is helpful. that you've used to pry on something else 
fits down inside there really well. Okay. Um, so improvising a tool for that for the removal of this is what I recommend for okay. you know a homeowner. Yeah. And then I had a guy who sent me a European coin to stick in there. Right. You know, one of my followers. All right. So we pull the plug. So just like you would in your car, you'd take the you know, you'd open up the you know open up the cap, take the dipstick out. Yeah. We want to take it out and inspect the oil just a little bit ahead of time. Okay just so that we can check to make sure what kind of conditions we're expecting when we drop the oil from the drain plug on the bottom. So in this case, of course, it doesn't have a whole lot of wear on, on yeah, the trans housing not, yet. Not a super old machine. So oil's still nice and clear, so it looks like factory condition. And um, fit in 50 hours. Yes, 50 hours of, of use. So for, um, for a lot of your customers that are using this once a week for about an hour uh, at a time, they're gonna look at probably about a year's worth of service before they hit that mark. But if they mm. find that they're using it more routinely, then I would probably do it after about six months worth of use. Mm. Uh, at that point, when you're changing the oil and it has sufficiently broken in, mm -hmm. you'll find that it has kind of a dark, um, somewhat yeah. metallic, uh, not so much metallic, but like a dark black Yeah, it was uh, like a dark appearance. gray kind of gray. Yeah, almost like a graphite appearance yeah. to it. And you start freaking out. Right. But it's supposed to do that. It is. Okay. <laughs> right. So it's it's basically the, you know, the, the machine components inside the transmission housing have been uh, working against one another. The friction is, is kind of worn a path into the mm -hmm. certain components. So you've got some of that metallic wear that's broken okay. in, down in there. So that's normal. Right. And then uh, the manual says you never have to change oil again. Right. Do you recommend... I, I think that it's wise to, to change it about once a year for the, for the common you know, okay. user that's using it about once a week. Okay. Uh, you know. I've only changed mine once. Yeah. In nine well, years in I, life. you know, because, <laughs> because I treat my pressure washer with, you know, ex Preventative. expectations that it's yeah. going to last forever, I change mine when it a is absolutely so, necessary. So same as you know, <laughs> most of the guys that are washing this would change their oil in their car. You know, that Porsche says 15,000 miles, most of them would do it at five. Right. You know? So that makes sense. Okay. So there's the, the, the fill and the dipstick on top right and then we have the drain bolt on the bottom so right? on the drain plug on the bottom you'll need a 13 millimeter socket okay. or wrench and since we have the soap tube here if someone doesn't use this they can just yank it off right? that's there's right nothing else they need to do I yeah get that question a lot it, it doesn't uh it doesn't harm the pressure washer to remove it okay um so you can pull it off. Yeah, I had a customer that was insistent that he plug it instead. Mm. And I told him, well, we're gonna have to get you one of those metric plugs directly from Krenzla, because of course it's the machine thread of that plug is not a standard mm. pipe thread. So it's not likely something you're gonna find at a hardware yeah. store. So we'll break out a metric socket. And forgive me, my car workers were in here yesterday. So it, it won't dump until you lean it back? Well, I'm just gonna break it loose. Okay. So it too will be pretty tight on the first uh, first removal. Crush you, washer or no crush washer? No, this has an O-ring. Okay. Does this need to be replaced or can it be reused? The O-ring can be reused. Okay. As long as it's not marred or damaged in the process okay. of, of changing the oil. So, um, Obviously, hand start it. Don't use like an electric impact or anything like that right. to, to strip it because that's the main housing of the pump that you don't want to have. Yeah, the transmission housing is uh, aluminum, so if you were to cross thread it with the brass, I mean they're both soft. You probably get uh, cross threading on both sides, which would be difficult to repair without replacing the housing. Okay. Um, I find that it's helpful to prop up the wheels or possibly even both the wheels and the supports on the front, mm -hmm. so that you can get this to a position where you can okay. just slide the uh, plug Understood. underneath, but we're doing our we're in our production uh, area here, so we're we're yeah we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna see how little mess I can make uh, today. Yeah. So this is the best drain pan for this task. Okay. Uh, just an oil, one quart oil jug. Cut the side out. Fits right nice underneath when we lay it down. So now. I usually wait to remove the, the fill plug until I remove the drain plug so that the oil doesn't flow too quickly out of the transmission housing. Mm. But as I mentioned before, you wanna loosen the fill plug before you start to drain the oil because there may be some pressure in the transmission housing. Okay. So relieve the pressure, but leave it in. Right. 
So now we've got got our oil coming out. Mm -hmm. And, then and there's only, you're only gonna get a half a quart maybe. Right, well not even that much. It's, it's like I said, it's about a third of a quart. I think it's actually mm -hmm. 0.3 liters, three tenths of a liter. Do you recommend like a car, should you heat it up and you know, run it for a little bit and then change it? With, with Krenzler pumps, if the oil is milky, I would say yes. Okay. If the oil is getting milky because water is sneaking past the, so the water seals and getting into the transmission housing and emulsifying in the oil, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit better to, it's better from the aspect that it helps to uh, lower the viscosity and help the oil drain out a little better. Okay. But at the same time, if it's really, really milky and it's starting to get to the point where it's almost like shaving cream or, mm -hmm. or whipped cream, then I may not want to run it at all because in that case, you're not getting good lubrication. Taking and, time bomb, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're running the risk of damage of the machine. Now, that is, that is something we're gonna look for in the oil is, and that'll tell us other preventative maintenance. Is this a magnetic? Yeah, so the plug in this has a, a magnet, so you'll find that your, your breakdown wear is, has dropped at the bottom. The, the Focus. Focus. transmission components, Mm -hmm. are stainless steel, but the greatest stainless steel does have some magnetism to it. Okay. So you get that fallout, gravity drops it to the bottom, and then it all kind of adheres to the inside of the base of the plug. So clean that out. Yep. So we'll clean that out. Sometimes I might use a little bit of parts cleaner or uh, carbon show cleaner to clean it out. But if you do so, solvent cleaners do unhappy things to the O-rings that are in pressure washers. Mm -hmm. So it's not wise to, it's best to take that O-ring off. Got it. So, and you can tell it's clean once you see the snap ring. Okay. So there's a snap ring in there. So you wanna clean that out so you can see it. And so this O-ring that's around there, you wanna inspect that, make sure there are any tears or anything like yep. that. Yep, and it's usually pretty evident. Yep. So. So then you take the plug out. Yep, we should have the majority of our oil drained out. Now, of course, this is, you know, as an obsessed garage, mm -hmm. some of your customers are gonna let this sit here and drain for, for longer than others, I'm sure, but. Uh, <laughs> In a mechanic shop, dump, dump, <laughs> yeah. bang, bang, get right. it out, right? Well, um, in cases where I also have to change the seals in the pump okay. and I'm changing the oil then as well, might I might it. actually take the transmission housing off and wipe out the entire housing. Hmm. In fact, I, on other models of Krenzler pumps where the, the housing, trans housing sticks out past the, the chassis of the, of the pressure washer, mm -hmm. I actually, instead of you starting with the drain plug, I pull the faceplate off mm -hmm. first because, you know, it's all about time in the shop. Got it. So if you really wanted to go, well, let's do that. Let's do the whole to tear that sucker off. Tear it off. Have, well, now do you want that? That's going to include pulling everything apart. Are we going to jump into that now, or do you want to uh, start with a different step first? Um, All right. Yeah, you're right. Let's stick with let's stick with basic oil change here. Well, if you're going to take it off, then we can't. So yeah, let's go. Go. Just start tearing stuff apart. Okay. Let's go. All right. So normal oil procedure is now we'd put the drain back in, we'd inspect the oil. Right. So tell me about what, what, are, we, what are we looking for in oil? So they're, 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 it could be gray, it could be milky, or it could be normal. Right. So normal wear and tear in the oil, it's going to go from clear, you know, almost oh yeah, like an amber clear color uh -huh. to, um, you know, dark molasses. Um, and that's generally on the first... First change or forever? Um, well, if you're using it a lot and it gets hot, like say for customers that are in southern states where the temperature is a little higher, mm -hmm. you may see the breakdown of the oil get a little darker in the summertime. Okay. Um, but what we're trying to, what we're hoping not to see is milky oil. Mm -hmm. And this, this oil right here is relatively clear. You know, this of course still, this doesn't look like it's had, it's had the breakdown mm -hmm. uh, oil change yet. So we do have... You know, some, some some graphite looking stuff. Yeah, in there. some graphite color in there. Okay. Um, plus possibly a little residual oil from the drain pan itself, but you yeah. still want to see a relatively clear oil, not cloudy, um, mm -hmm. not milky or latte like. You know, if it's starting to look like Dunkin' Donuts coffee, then it's. Then we need seals. 
That's yeah. basically a telltale sign. Exactly. Which isn't the end of the world. No, no, it's not. Okay. I mean, the seals are the, the brake pads and the tires of the pressure washer. So uh, if we're using it, then ultimately That's... we're going to see wear of wear parts. Got it. But you don't have to panic that your your machine is ruined and, and your life is over. Yeah, no. You just change them, and we're going to show you how to do that. That's yeah. the main reason why I'm coming here because I've shown people how to do an oil change, but we, you know, I don't, I haven't done a seal kit. I haven't had to, and so right. we're going to do all these preventative maintenance things. So uh, we were just talking about we're going to remove the hose rail here in a second. But uh, one of the common freakout points for me and my obsessed people is this little o what looks to be an O-ring. Right. But this thing here, if you see leaking coming from the you know, coming from the bottom, right, the, it's generally or almost always the green O-ring. Right. This is just simply a stop. Yeah, that's that a holds your holds your thing. So the more I move it down, the more I'm allowed to. Right, it's a superficial part that it it's like you said, it's just uh just a to to stop to keep our keep our um, keep the collar from falling back on the hose. Right. Right. Okay, so let's remove the hose reel so we can get to the head of the pump All here. Right. So we're gonna need a seventeen uh, seventeen millimeter for for one side of the collar on the compression fitting, mm -hmm. a nineteen for the other. I usually only like to break it loose from one side as opposed to both. So this is an area commonly that'll come loose in shipping, and so sometimes you just need to reseed it, I've found. Right. So it's a simple two wrenches, mm -hmm. pull it out. It's always wise to... to to Loose on both sides. Yeah, well, it's always wise to have two wrenches. You don't want to right. just turn on the on the compression fitting itself because it may actually loosen up from the housing of the pump or from the chemical injector instead. Okay. So. I often will only just loosen up one side, but we'll loosen up both just to show that once you break it loose, it makes it a little easier to move that fitting. So mm -hmm. when, when we take and unbolt the, the hose reel, it'll come So how does easier. the chemical injector know when there's something connected, like when, when you have it in a bucket of soap? Like, a, so, is this a check valve, a one-way valve of some there sort? There is a check valve inside the inside the chemical injector, which is a way that all downstream chemical injectors work in the pressure washing field. Okay. The uh, whenever the pressure inside the the line drops to below 500 psi, which is is an approximation, but it's somewhere in that range. Once it drops below that, the water is filling the cavity inside the chemical injector differently than it does when it's under full pressure. Okay. Um, pressure washer pumps on their own create no pressure. They just create flow. The, si the size of the orifice or the opening in the nozzle mm -hmm. creates a certain amount of restriction to result in a certain amount of pressure, which sure. is why it's critical that we use the right size nozzles for this machine versus yep. the 1622 and larger pressure washers. So when you have that restriction, um, you're filling up the entire cavity with fluid mm -hmm. and it's pushing the check valve closed. Okay. Whenever you drop below 500 PSI, the fluid going through the chemical injector is going through an orifice, very similar to the orifice in the nozzle, mm -hmm. and uh, it comes through like a jet shooting past that uh, pickup tube. Grabbing a little bit of Cre chemical. Creating a venturi uh, okay. siphon, which then siphons the chemical into the stream that's then... Um, so to activate this, I need to bring pressure down? Correct. Okay, so if I'm running full full boat, then I'm not gonna get, I can stick that in, I stick the soap tube in there, it won't, right. it just won't do anything. So, and that's a common, pro um, a common problem with uh, other brands of pressure washers. We're like, well, I'm using all the, all the different colored nozzles and I'm not getting any, any soap. And they're like, mm -hmm. well, have you used the, the black soap tip? Well, no, because it doesn't create any pressure. It's like, well, that's the point. That's, got it. It's a low that's pressure. Why they, okay, that's why. See, I, we never use these because for cars, we're using an external foam cannon at the right. end. So we can get really heavy foam right. instead of just, you know, adding some, some chlorine or soap to the or cleaning agents. Yeah, and I mean, you could use that for certain applications um, in the detailing industry. Say, for instance, you have a uh, drying agent or a um, some other chemical that, you know, has a purpose that sure. that can that you can achieve the right dilution ratio. That would be the key because mm -hmm. this is going to mix about one part chemical to ten parts water. Um, so you'd have to, if you needed uh, one one nineteenth, you'd have to have you pre diluted in order to, to right. compensate. And if for you need it stronger than that, then there wouldn't be any way for this uh, injector mm. to accomplish that. But 
Um, we there are some um, finished waxes for fleet and automotive washing where you can dilute them up to like 300 or 400 parts mm -hmm. um, to one. So in that case, you could pre-mix it between three to one and four to one, mm -hmm. drop your uh, injector tube into that container, and then use this to apply that, that quick finish wax to the wow. surface. Okay, cool. So the hose reel, so you're gonna loosen this. Yep, loosen and your, then your first. And then we're gonna remove the four screws that hold the hose reel on. Now make sure you get really good close-ups of all my clumsy. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like the catchy slipping. Yeah. It's not hard to do. There's our hose reel. Now these Quarter. screws are very easy to lose, so I often like to take them out and set them aside so that they yeah, don't get lost. And that's lost. when you can tell as a real mechanic. You know. I certainly wouldn't do that. I'd be kicking them on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Where and, is it? And then you'll call me and ask me if I have them in stock. I need more, yeah. You know. All right. Okay. All right. So, so, this, so that's a tiny little head, huh? Yes. Does that mean it's bad? Well, no. I, th clearly, it's uh, what you'll find in a lot of new pressure washers that are in the uh, industry for consumers mm -hmm. is that their pump head isn't any larger than this. Yeah. And theirs is made entirely of plastic. Yeah. This is machined out of a solid brass cast or solid brass um, no, housing. Brass, yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, that is the key to the long life of the Krenzler pressure washer. The uh, good transmission of heat withstands uh, cold and freezing temperatures well. Um, I'm reluctant to describe it as freeze proof, but it's as close as you're gonna get. So for freezing on that, on that topic, let's say you're in Minnesota, it's mm -hmm. in your garage, um, just run the water out and let it sit there. I mean, as long as it's not filled and under pressure and froze. Uh, that would be suitable for the pump head. Mm -hmm. I recommend for the system mm -hmm. running RV antifreeze through the, the pump and hose okay. because the pump head's not what's, what's gonna fail. Okay. The connection tube to the chemical injector is gonna fail, the mm -hmm. chemical injector is gonna fail, the hose is gonna fail. But can I just leave the thing run for like 10 seconds, dry? You can, they have that recommendation in their manual and that yeah. will, as long as you allow air to purge all the water in the system, yeah. um, that will uh, protect it. It's not the, the, the highest level of protection, but it is protection. So does that cause significant damage? Like I don't, prime the thing, I just fire it up and it blows the air out. Right. And then when I'm done, I just turn, I, I turn the water off and let it run for like 10 seconds and that's how I do it. Is that a bad thing to do? I recommend disconnecting the, the supply line uh -huh. from, the, from the inlet of the pump okay. because the, you know, this is a hydraulic system. Okay. So a deficit in fluid, uh -huh. whether it be air or water, is what can cause the most damage to the pump. Okay. So if you're starving it, that's when you start to cause a lot of failure inside the house, inside of the. So if I, if I disconnect it from my hose bib, mm -hmm. then it's free to just pull, pull. Loose, loose air. It won't create any kind of backflow or anything. Right. Well, it's, yeah, it's not going to cause uh, cavitation, which is where you start creating small microscopic levels of implosion and explosion where fluid is, uh, where vapor is being pulled out of and forced back into the fluid, okay. which is what will chew up a lot of your seals inside of your pump. It's very clear and evident when we, um, you know, Have customers- a cavitated pump. Yeah, yeah, cavitated pump has a lot of uh, signs and indicators that of what's happened. You're gonna find uh, marks on the O-rings that looks like it's chewed by a little mouse. Uh -huh. uh, the seals will look skidded like, you know, the tires on my kid's bike. Hmm. So yeah. that's, uh, it's better to disconnect it. And like I said, if that's you're- That's new, that's something I never thought of. So, but I can, you know, turn, I can have this, it'll, it'll, you know, the pressure, the, since there is no pressure in the system, it'll, it runs real quiet. It's mm -hmm. all, you know, just, to, it'll, you know, blow water through for like 10 seconds right. and then hold it. And then I walk over and I turn it off. And, and, and to the same extent, when you're doing that, you should have these disconnected from the line. Yeah. And 
you know, these aren't going to be protected from, from freeze if they're filled with fluid also. So, sure. you know, take your nozzles out of your quick disconnects right. and then... You, know, you don't have to worry about, like, the there's line. always going to be drips of water in here. As long as it's oh, not yeah. filled with water, right. even if it froze, nothing, it's not going to damage anything, right? Mm. I mean, right. No, what damages is if it's filled with water and expands and breaks everything. Exactly. Yeah, got it. Okay. All right. So, oh, another question for you. I have a million of them. So why don't we, you know, because you have the you have the gauge, right? And it's going to read fourteen hundred psi on this machine, roughly. Right. If you're using the stock wand. And that, and it's important to point out that the red markings on the in, uh, inner diameter of the right. gauge. Yeah, the outside the is bar, right? Right. So why, instead of changing the orifice, why wouldn't I just start turning the the unloader? For... Why is that good or bad to adjust pressure? It's, you know, it's always been recommended to me that we don't adjust pressure using this. We do it using orifice size. Well, you can turn it down. Now, the person you've been speaking with that's encouraged you to do that is Patricia. Yeah. So the reason why she's done that is because we find a lot of customers that when they lose pressure as a result of water supply issues, uh -huh. they start manipulating yeah. the, the, the uh, unloader valve handle. And in some cases, there are ways that we could manipulate the unloader valve handle to get even more pressure out of this pump if we were to also change the nozzle to a smaller orifice on the gun. Right. But at that point in time, you're going to start to overamp the motor, right. which can then cause it to fail, right. as well as cause your breakers to pop, your GFI to fail, capacitors, you name it. So let's say I've got a, this has a 4.2 size nozzle from the factory. Yep. Right? So let's say I'm using a 4.2, you know, recommended nozzle or size on the, on the, on the, you know, on the, on the gun. Then I wanted to run 500 PSI. Am I, am I, am I, am I affecting or damaging or hurting the pump long term by unloading some of the pressure? No. No, that's a, that's the purpose and intent of this particular device. Especially if, if you've gone through the manual on the, that comes with the machine, mm -hmm. that's what the Germans recommend is for you to turn uh, turn counterclockwise the unloader valve handle. Mm -hmm. All the way counterclockwise will drop the pressure down to a negligible pressure mm -hmm. almost at zero. Um, but what I don't want to do, this is But it's is doing a, that, it's important to point out, it's doing that by decreasing the flow as well. So you're mm. decreasing pressure and flow. Okay. So That's for, for washing cars, we definitely, we want as much flow as we can get. Exactly. So when you're trying to drop the pressure down to a lower output, uh, by increasing the orifice size, you're decreasing the restriction on the flow mm. and then consequently dropping the pressure, but still retaining the full, mm. full flow of the motor. So another interesting thing is, you know, this on the pump head is measuring, say, 14, 1450, somewhere in the 14 to 1500 PSI range. Right. But if I stick a gauge on the output uh, near my gun, mm -hmm. I'm getting 1,000. So, so is your that line... drivetrain loss? Is that line loss? Yeah, I mean, that's... Is that pretty typical? It's typical. Yeah. And then, then there's also a, a fudge factor that is, with all gauges, they can be calibrated to a certain extent. But, sure. you know, they're... Um, and in some cases, depending on, you know, on other brands of pressure washers, when you read the, what they're rated for on the side of the box, most of our competitors, they're reading not what's in the pump head, even when it's, when you're spraying, yeah, they're giving you the at, pressure at when 100, it, yeah, 100, well, right, PSI. Well, when you release a trigger on the gun, in order for it to go into bypass, that trap pressure is a slight is about 10 to 20 percent higher yeah. than what you can actually get out of the pump. Mm -hmm. So they'll advertise that as you know, this is technically when this is in bypass, you've got about 1800 psi. Well, a lot of cheap pumps, they don't even go into bypass. They just drop. They lose pressure completely and have to rebuild every time. Right. Which is really bad for the operation of the pump. Right. Okay. So now what? So this the the so. You, you were talking about, um, you know, if you're really obsessed, you're changing the oil, you're going to take the hose reel off, you're going to take the head off yep. and clean it out. All so right. I want to see what, I've so, never seen inside of that thing. So do you want me to just to pull the pump head? Well, before we pump, pull the pump head off, I'm yeah, going to pull some other components apart. Yeah, show me some stuff here. So um, this is easier to do with a skinnier wrench. If mm -hmm. you've got a wrench that's the head is too wide, you may have to pop the end cap off of this, removing the, the limiting nut that uh -huh. prevents you from just unwinding it all the way, and then unscrew the handle further. But if you've got a skinny enough wrench, you can squeeze it in there, get it on the head, another 19 millimeter, and then that way we can remove the control piston of the unloader valve. How would you determine unloader valve issues? 
Like, what, is this a general, is this a part you see often needs to be replaced or repaired? The unloader valve is a very common uh, service item and even more so on commercial pressure washers. Because it's constantly popping, especially with our uh, one like this. Where right, it doesn't well, run anytime constantly. the trigger's released, this is switching position. Mm -hmm. So in uh, the cleaning industry, we call uh, operators that open and close the gun as though it were a machine gun, trigger jockeys. Okay. <laughs> and trigger jockeys will cause wear on this a lot faster than just normal operation of the pump. So the breakdown that you would you would start to see, like I was talking about cavitation, you'll start to see lines in the in the O-ring that can also happen from it actuating over and over and over again. You also start to see a lip built up on this flat O-ring. Mm -hmm. There are uh, two O-rings. One is a round O-ring and one is a flat O-ring, which mm -hmm. let's take a closer look. So the, the name say, for yeah. this flat O-ring is a parback, which I found out is a, it's kind of like the tissue of, you know, Kleenex of tissue. Mm -hmm. um, it is a flat O-ring that, that goes with your round O-ring that increases the pressure uh, ability of the, you know, mm. the pressure limitations of the O-ring. So you've got this O-ring, which has a cupped surface on one edge. Yep. And then the other side is flat. And then that traditional. And then your traditional Circular o -ring. rounded O-ring. Yep. So when those go on, the rounded O-ring, let me confirm this. Round it always goes yeah, toward towards, the piston end or toward... On the outermost surface, in this case. In some cases, you'll find that they'll have a parback O-ring on both sides. Hmm. Of so the, rounded goes, rounded to red. Exactly. R to R. Okay. So the other thing that will indicate that we've had a lot of cycling is the tip of the unloader stem right here, or control piston, is what pushes the bypass check valve on the other side open. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it's been cycling a lot because you have leaking quick disconnects, mm -hmm. uh, that is going to start to look hammered and misshapen. It should have a little bit of a cup in the center. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then, you know, that. this is just a round stem. So it was machined out to be the same diameter all the way. But that's easily replaceable. The issue is it's also causing damage inside, wouldn't it be? Yeah, it, well, it, where, you know, it, the additional wear that it can be causing if there's cavitation and cycling taking place is, uh, you know, the most expensive part isn't what's happening in the water side. Mm -hmm. It's what's happening in your oil housing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So are those a replacement part as part of a seal kit or no? These O-rings are yeah. available. They're not presently available in a kit. Okay. Hopefully we'll be able to convince the Germans to change that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we sell these O-rings. Um, we also sell this entire uh, assembly yep. with the handle and the spring and everything. And then the, the metal, stainless steel metal stem and brass component is available without the, the spring and the, the handle and the other small bearing that's underneath. So could I buy this whole thing assembled just like this? We have it right here. That's what I would do, yeah. And there's your part number. And just boom. Exactly. Idiot and, proof. And now, it's not, of course, the, the best way to set the unloader valve. You know, it actuates in, in a method that's similar to a pressure relief valve. There are, um, and I'll show it to you. Since this, since this machine has a pressure gauge, you can set the unloader valve, you know, relatively easily. But underneath this, oh, the sure. handle, okay. you've got couple bearing components to make it easy to, to wind open and close. Mm -hmm. Then your spring. Bang. So you've got limiting nuts here that prevent the operator from being able to, you know, we were talking about when you tighten it all the way up, you're mm -hmm. reaching full pressure, but we don't want to go more than that because that in some cases you may increase the pressure beyond the limitations of the motor drive, you know, the drive of the motor and the yeah, and then you're pulling 22 amps on a 15 amp, you know. Right. Now, on some gas machines and some other types of pressure washers, all it's doing is, is increasing the amount of pressure that it needs to create in order to go into bypass. Mm -hmm. So, because this is the, the, the natural actuation of that valve. 
or the control so piston. so if i buy that kit is that pre are those lock nuts preset these are not preset when so typically how, when you so how the heck do i know what to set them so so when we install the unloader valve handle with the it's best with the factory nozzle mm -hmm. but you know any nozzle you know as long as it's within the range that we've you know, recommended mm -hmm. you can use. You're gonna pull the trigger on the gun with the unloader valve turned most of the way out. Okay. Okay. As you turn in the unloader valve, you'll start to see the pressure rise. Okay. Once you, there's two things we're looking for. One, we're looking for it to get up to the rated pressure. 1400. Then we're also looking for it to get up to a point where it's not increasing any further. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we didn't know what the pressure was supposed to be, then we're just looking for the point at which it stops. Okay. Now, if additional rotations can be made at that point, then we know that these jam nuts need to be moved back in Got order it. to stop it before it reaches that point. So say I get to this point right here and I can make one additional rotation before mm -hmm. it stops. I want to back these nuts off one additional rotation. So right. I, mar I mark the jam nuts with, with a black permanent marker. Mm -hmm. I loosen them. And then usually I'll stick with the one that's on the outside is the one that I want to make sure gets to a position and stays. So I'll take and make that one full rotation. Then I'll turn this one and snug it up against that nut. And then and, you'll know that's your stop, right? And then, your... then we'll retest just to make sure, but you should see where it rises to the mm. set pressure that you're looking for yep. and uh, then it'll bypass and actuate. So what happens if uh, someone's, the, that's interesting, this is kind of like going in and modifying your car. You know, you can go and turn up the boost a little bit right. if you wanted so, to. Right, so like I said, you, we're gonna blow up the... you don't want to over pressurize the, the system because as you, you know, these are working at the, the, the top end of the load range. Uh -huh. So, you know, we recommend a dedicated 15 amp circuit for the pressure washer. Yeah, when I, this, I tell everybody to do a dedicated 20. Just well, and that's it. wise, because yeah. when this thing is, is operating in prime, you know, in good brand new condition, yeah. I pull the trigger, we can measure almost uh, somewhere between 14 and a half and 15 amps. Yep. And now, then when I'm, the, the issue we've had is a foam cannon will get it to pull, you know, in, in short instances, a burst of like 17 and that pops. Well, pops and even more than that, yeah. when you first start and stop the pressure washer motor, yeah, the, the inrush current, yeah. the inrush current or, or peak amperage can be almost three times the rated amperage of the machine. Right. Um, most breakers are, are, are designed to withstand that for, yeah. for that small amount of time. Mm -hmm. But, um, if it's if you've got it set all the way up to you know 1800 or 2000 psi and you're already you know running it you know you release it or starting and stopping the machine it's overdriving and you're increasing your odds of blowing something up right exactly how and you'll you guys will know that when someone sends it in yeah that they did that well things that we're looking for is we'll set it up with a factory nozzle we'll see what mm -hmm. the pressure output is we're reading the the amperage that is drawing and then also we can take and measure the capacitance of the capacitors mm -hmm. and over time of that exposure to that over amping it starts to kill the capacitors because mm -hmm. they're overheating as a result yeah so but I mean, it's all replaceable, so you're just, you know, you're on your own doing that kind of stuff. It's like, it's like you, you know, you tune your BMW and you blow it up, and it's on you. Yeah. You're not going to warranty that crap. No, that that is a uh, yeah. not a manufacturer's defect. Yeah, certainly not. Yeah. So, that port that I was saying that overcomes the that causes the piston to to actuate is mm -hmm. is right at the tip of my pick. Right here, let me turn around. Right in the side, right there. Okay. So that's the direction that the, the water is flowing to create the back pressure on this piston behind these O-rings to then push it forward, overcoming the pressure on the spring. Okay. So now the reason I show you that, <clears throat> if for some case, in, in some cases we might reach a point where we're really hitting our heads on the wall. We've replaced a bunch of different parts and it's still not actuating properly. Mm -hmm. In those rare cases, um, occasionally it's because an O-ring or some small piece of debris could be stuck in that port. And, mm -hmm. you know, 
it's hard to translate over the phone to, to some end users that may not, you know, don't have the familiarity with the pump or may not have the mechanical aptitude to know what to look for. And, you know, that is a small, minute detail. You know, most, most guys will look in there and not even notice that little port that's on the side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are some things where, you know, that's one of those things where we've tried really hard and then ultimately mm -hmm. it ends up coming back. But that's hopefully something that you will rarely, if ever, encounter. So this is your outlet check valve. Another mechanism of the unloader valve assembly. Now your unloader valve is not one valve, it's a system of valves. So this is a, a check valve, that's your, the ball check. Mm -hmm. There's the spring. And then inside of here, there is a stainless steel seat. Okay. Can you see it? Yep. And then around the stainless steel seat, we have this retaining clip. Water's coming this way right. and then going out into the hose reel. So don't all those 90 degree angles mess up the flow? Well, you asked what the, causes the drop in pressure from here to the, mm. the valve and the gun. Mm -hmm. It does have an impact. Got it. So now this is where, so your fluid is coming you know, coming in this direction. So mm -hmm. this is usually pressed up against here whenever yeah. it's running. So then the fluid is actually coming out of these ports huh. on this fitting Interesting. to then exit. That's those tiny little holes. Yep. Dang it, the focus is terrible on this thing. Well, once it does focus. So the water's coming out of these tiny little, little holes on the side. Tiny little openings. And that's a common seal it needs to be. Yeah, there's an O-ring there. Or O-ring, yeah. Okay, so. The unloader valve assembly, you've got the control piston side and we've got the outlet check valve side. Mm -hmm. So besides that, we also have the bypass valve. In order to get to that bypass valve, we're going to remove the pressure switch. So your pressure switch, when you remove the uh, screws from the pressure switch, beware that the, uh, the little nuts on the back side of the pressure switch housing yeah. are not pressed or or molded into the plastic so they can fall out and disappear yeah and disappear exactly and once again metric so you're not going to find them at home depot uh no uh, you have to go to lowe's okay lowe's has a pretty good selection of metric parts not that i'm endorsing either one so those two little screws are holding the pressure switch housing in place. So there's the little little nuts that I was describing. Mm -hmm. Because once again, I lose everything like that screw. I like to pull them out and set them aside together. So those screws are sitting in this little groove on the pressure switch assembly, mm -hmm. on the actual mechanical assembly of the pressure switch. Mm. And then there's a small O-ring here around it to cushion it. It's not to seal anything, obviously, because this is the, the mechanic or the electrical end of the switch, mm -hmm. which we can see the micro switch there. So in some cases where we're having issues diagnosing why the machine may or may not be switching on and off, mm -hmm. uh, we may sometimes have the Op, you know, the owner or the operator of the machine, remove these screws, pull out on this, and while the gun is being depressed in its n normal operation or released in its normal operation, manually we push that manually down. actuate that switch. And then you and, can eliminate or, you know, that. And that's the case for this model as well as some of the other Krenzel models, which we'll discuss mm -hmm. another time. So this, this little guy right here is a 15 millimeter you know, they kept everything relatively uniform, but that's the one 15 millimeter socket that you need. So for the customers that have pressure loss right after they get the machine out of the box, mm -hmm. you know, be rest assured that every one of these machines has been tested at Krenzla before it left the factory. Mm -hmm. However, that does not mean that it can't get to you and fail to operate correctly. So in those rare instances, 
we look to this device right here. This is the easy start valve and is also the bypass valve. So as we discussed before, that's sitting on this side of the pump. This is sitting on the other side. And whenever it goes into bypass, this is pushing forward and pushing the bypass valve out of the way. And inside here is another ring with another stainless steel valve seat inside that port. Mm -hmm. Now, when customers say that they have replaced the check valves, they replaced the seals, they replaced the unloader valve, and they're still not getting any pressure. And we've also, of course, replaced the nozzles. I can almost always guarantee that they haven't replaced that seat mm -hmm. because that valve seat if it starts to warp, this isn't sealing against it properly, and you're not gonna get full pressure if you're not forcing full amount of flow going out the outlet. Mm -hmm. So that's usually where it'll sneak by. So what a recommendation would be if you're gonna re replace this, replace that too? Um, I have to look, but I'm almost certain that the, that the, well, no, that's right. The kit comes with all this stuff. The seat and the seat, O-ring and clip are the, the other one. After hours and hours of use, mm -hmm. gets nice and hot and cold and hot and cold, the O-ring will start to just uh, you know, maintain a shape where it's allowing water to flow past. So I would suggest that if we're in it that deep, like if you like DIY yeah, this, replace this, but if it's, that didn't fix the problem, right? UPS the sucker here and let you fix right. it. Right. That's the these two seats that are in that port and that port are m usually the breaking point where the customer says, "Look, I don't, I'm, wanna, not, I'm yeah. not messing with it. Well, I'm sending it, it to you." Certainly would be for me. Yeah. So, but uh, the Easy Start valve also has a very small check valve inside. Hmm. Uh, you can, I wouldn't even bother bringing yeah, out your know. camera because it's down inside of there. Yep. Um, when, you know, one of the questions we might ask from a tech support point of view is, if you hold it up, can you see through it? If you can see through it, oh. the, the ball bearing has gone somewhere and who the heck knows where. But um, if you can see through it, you're not gonna get full pressure because of course this is supposed to seal against that seat mm -hmm. in order to create full pressure. The other thing that can happen is if, if you shake it back and forth, there's a little, little, little tiny uh, spring in, this, in the back end holding that ball bearing in place. If that spring fails, then you'll hear this go back and forth. And in some cases, it'll give you full pressure. In some cases, it won't. Mm. So if I've got uh, intermittent pressure loss, this is one of, the, one of the areas, one of the mechanical areas that I look to. Mm. But the most common cause of pressure loss is, is not getting enough water through the pump or air being introduced into the supply, mm -hmm. which would then cause cavitation, which we can, you know, discover or find in other places. So from here, we'll go to the gauge replacements. Gauge is a really simple DIY thing where you unscrew it. Yes, pop sir. Pop a new one on. We will, We'll send with it also a small uh, smash O-ring or smash gasket, a little aluminum washer that goes down inside. Okay. There's a little bit of, uh, and this is a good, you can see that whatever water was run through this, you got some minerals, a little bit of calcium. So this is in our drinking water. Yeah. A little bit of little funk. So um, those, those are put there to make it so that when the gauge reaches a point that it is sealed with the threads, it also can be read straight, mm -hmm. which for, you know, I'm not a, a super obsessed guy, but <laughs> my gauges have to be straight. Yeah. And these are oil operated gauges. So well, glycerin filled. Yeah. So you'll see air bubbles. Air bubbles. And it's not gonna be the same amount of air bubble or glycerin in every single gauge. The purpose of the glycerin is to minimize the amount of vibration. It's not that it needs to be uh, void of, of air in order to operate correctly. It's just that it's, uh, you know, there to help try to prevent the, you know, you got gauge a lot of- Bouncing around. Yeah, yeah, and this is a, there's a lot of dynamic pressure change in a, in a pressure washer pump, which is why these gauges, are more likely to fail than say in an air compressor system where there's a steady rise and fall of the mm -hmm. pressure. So let's set this over here. So now we've got the parts out, we've got the gauge out of the way and the other components so we can open up our check valves to check 
and inspect those as well. So each one of these are individual check valves? There are six check valves. Why the heck do we need six of them? Okay. So as we discussed, it's a positive displacement pump. Mm -hmm. um, most pressure washer pumps are called triplex pumps, and that's not triple X as in, you know, uh, you booby bar pumps. Uh, triplex is the type of pump that has three plungers. In the early days of pressure washer pumps, they, it was more common to have duplex pumps, but two piston pumps have more pulsation to them. Okay. So for your application in particular, uh, detailing and, and delicate surfaces, we want a more s smooth, consistent, uh, you know, there's still a, like a pulsation there mm -hmm. um, in the spray, but it's almost, uh, it's almost undetectable because there's three plungers instead of two. If we were to inhibit one of these you know, one of these six check valves, mm -hmm. you're gonna get a pulsation that's like the massage setting on a shower head. Hmm. So these, these are triplex? These are triplex pumps, yes. Oh, I thought they were, I thought they were just two whatevers. No, nope. and we'll- Two we'll, plexes. Yeah, we'll, we'll Diplex. see. Diplex. We'll see all three, three of the plungers once we get inside the valve housing. Okay. Um, so each plunger works like a syringe. Its purpose is to pull water in and push water back out. Okay. So for us to get that positive displacement, we need to have one check valve per, per plunger. Or mm. yes, we need two check valves per plunger. So you have your inlet check valves on the bottom mm. and your outlet check valves on the top. It just so happens that we put a gauge on one of them. Exactly. Okay. okay. So um, on your inlet valves, when the plunger pulls back, it's pulling water past the intake valve, and then when it pushes out, it's pushing it out past the discharge valve. Exhaust valve, I mean, you can use the same terms that you would in, in the, hmm. the, in the in, you know, in a combustion engine. But, and this is your check valves, what they're gonna look like when we pull them out. The Germans use two, two different color plastic, they're for different, um, I believe that they're for different spring tensions and, and also for, um, I think at one point in time they also had uh, certain type that were rated for high temperature, but for our purposes, you'll either see green valves or red valves. In most cases, they'll be red. Do you see these fail? Are these a, are these a common failure point? Um, once again, it is a wear item. Okay. So it will ultimately wear out, mm -hmm. but it is not normally the first item yeah. in, in a ideal circumstance type of operation. Mm -hmm. When we see them fail prematurely, it is because water that is being fed to the pump is either high in uh, particulate or mineral. Mm -hmm. um, what you'll see is the uh, valve plates aren't seating against the, the seats mm -hmm. um, or they're starting to uh, wear out or the mineral deposits on the spring cause the spring to fail. Mm -hmm. And then the valve plate isn't, you know, is becoming askew as it's opening and closing. Hmm. So we'll pop them out and see what these ones look like. Yep, see there's our green ones. So you can see, yeah, just after a little bit of water running through here, you got- Starting to get gummed up. Yeah, yeah, they're getting a little bit of a coloration just from the, the color of the water that sits inside the pump. Yeah. Another reason why I like running an antifreeze to it, because you know, I'm not obsessed about what the outside of my car looks like, but I like the inside parts to be all nice and shiny. Yeah. So, and then, you know, valve operation. There's your valve, valve mm -hmm. plate opening and closing. Now, if we ever, uh, try to describe a, the suction test. Uh, the suction test, you check, check valve, and you don't, you wanna feel it close. You might feel a little bit of air come through, but in most cases like that one, I can create a vacuum inside, you know, in there with just my lips, and uh, that means this check valve's in good shape. You can also see kind of from the, from the side what the, you know, if there's anything mm -hmm. going on with the check valve. If we get that pulsation that's like a massage setting on your shower head, it's usually because one of these is stuck in the open position like so. Hmm. And that can be from an O-ring that failed, um, you know, if you've got high, 
calcium content in your water, a little nugget of, of calcium could have made its way into the pump. So those are not uncommon for commercial pressure washing applications because they're hooking up to so many different water supplies, yeah. but your customers being hooked up to their own garden hoses on a regular basis, you, know, you, you won't see it as much. In addition to the check valve failure, the O-rings that are underneath of the check valves, if they break, they'll cause that pulsation as well. So this, these two are a little off. Yeah, they're. I they're, guess because of the input or the. Yeah, um, the discharge on the on the high pressure output. Got it. This is awesome. This is so simple, though. I mean. Well, this is what you came to Baltimore for, yeah, right? Yeah, anyone can kind of get into these things and. So there's our rings. Wow. This is a maintenance item. Yep. This would be like uh, changing your spark plugs kind of thing. Like not something you need to do every yeah. time you change the oil, but something that depending on water, depending on conditions, depending on use, depending on I, I would compare it to my brakes personally. Okay, you know? there you go. I like that. Um, the, the check valves will outlive the O-rings in most cases. Uh, okay. So if there was any one item that I would say that was like your spark plugs in this kit, uh -huh. I would replace the O-rings more often than I changed the, the check valves. Because along with cavitation, starting to chew up the O-rings, the, uh, like I said, the temperature range, you know, hot, cold, hot, cold, you'll start to get boxing of the O-rings. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it just starts to change the, the sealing capability of them. And that's when they ultimately will fail. And then that's when they get stuck and stuff and get in mm -hmm. that little port. And, and this is one of the main advantages to a commercial pressure wash. All the cheapy stuff, you can't do any of this stuff. They're all sealed, you know? Well, and you know, I've fixed a lot of Home Depot pressure washers yeah. in the past 13 years. And you can get kits for all sorts of stuff. Yeah. But often in the process of taking it apart, you find that every one of the wear parts has catastrophically failed. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it ends up being a moot point. I mean, I've had conversations. They're engineered to do that. So the people have to come back and get a new one. Planned obsolescence. Yeah. Yep. All right. So now you're actually going to take the head of the pump off. Yep. To, you want me to take a, take the pressure mil? switch assembly out? Um, would you ever need to do that? Well, since we're well, taking it all apart, might as well. Yeah, might as well. So this plunger works similarly to the unloader control piston. There won't be a lot of cases where where your customers will have to take this out, but there's the piston and then the spring that it's pressing up against. So it's, it's overcoming the tension on that spring to push out to break the tension on the, uh, or break the uh, flow of current going to the motor hmm. whenever you release the trigger on the gun. Um, it can cause short cycling in some machines. Mm -hmm. I've never witnessed it happen in one of these, but we recently had a case where one of our uh, a uh, customer, I can't remember where, uh, Upper New York or something like that, that's a commercial facility, um, had bought through one of our other dealers the stationary unit and it was brand new doing some short cycling and it was just a small nick on one of these O-rings. Mm. So it was causing it to... The reason why I wouldn't have customers mess with this very often is that inside here, the, the O-rings that seal on this part of the piston mm -hmm. are, you know, it's a sandwich of there's a brass ring, an O-ring, and then a parback O-ring, like there is right here. Mm -hmm. And they can be a real pain in the neck. To, to get out to and get, get back in. Right, get in. Getting in is really the, mm. the challenge that I run into, but yeah, getting them out is a pain too. So we'll leave that loose for now. Okay. All right, we're back at it. Back at it. Is this, do you know what, what is the 1152's inlet? You know what size it is? It's some weird, like 10 millimeter, or no. Or there some, is a. <clears throat> it's or male. BSPP, maybe. It's a male threaded fitting. I don't think it's BSP. Uh, um, is it G, maybe? G type? 
I you're going know. into thread types I'm unfamiliar with, so yeah, well, what to, they... I have to get my hands on one of them, because I have a lot of Europeans that are always buying, you know, my aftermarket stuff. Uh, so, guns and wands and hoses and stuff like that, and I know that the GHT, a garden hose fitting, garden hose thread, right. doesn't, like, this is a, this is three quarter inch GHT, we don't... Well, and there is only one size GHT. Right, right. which is beautiful. Um, but they don't use that in Europe, they're using some other kind of funky fitting. Right, and uh, our solution for that, like the inlet on the um, small quadros mm -hmm. has that. There's a, the small quadros have a float valve on the tank on the back. Mm -hmm. And we have a inlet filter, which the Germans also use, but ours has a, a GHT mm -hmm. connection Adapter, on one yeah. side. And then, and so, so that's- So a quadro is just four, four valves? No. Is that what you're talking about? Qua they call it a quadro, I believe, because it's on four wheels. Oh, okay, all right. If I had a guess, but, that's but the- but it's still, we don't call it triplex, it's called triplex. Well, you, potato, potato. Okay, got it. All right, get back to work. Come on, keep going. <clears throat> yes, sir. All right, so, so. What else do we do? So we're taking the head of the pump off. Taking the head of the pump off. So you will possibly need a six millimeter extended mm -hmm. Allen set. Oh, I didn't see there's two. Because you've got four, four, um, two short bolt or two long bolts for the valve housing yeah. and two short bolts for the valve housing. And that will come back into play when I show you how to take the, the face plate off the transmission housing because we use these longer bolts mm -hmm. to release the tension on the plunger springs when we're taking the face plate off and then also to get it back on. So, but with the valve housing, There's no tension. Nothing's gonna, nothing's going, this is a Load, common yeah. question. Is anything gonna come popping out at me? Yeah, are there like valve retainer springs or something? Yeah, there? no, not on, the, not on the wet side. See, this is just like my Porsche. Like it's made to be taken apart and put back together. I tell, something tells me that all these things will slide right back into place and. Well, you'll have to let me take your Porsche apart one mm -hmm. time so I can it's say. A, <laughs> It's it's amazing, man. You take panels off, it, everything pops up, pops apart, and pops right back into place. You yeah. know, like like even like the rear bumper. Uh, you take the rear bumper cover off of a BMW. It take you six hours to get it realigned up on a Porsche. On off minutes. It's amazing. Well, that's that's awesome. Yeah. So this uh, this you know this is the difference between you know German and Italian. So. Right. Well, the thing that I find with a lot of German engineered stuff is there tends to be a lot of plastic panels that protect a lot of things. Yeah. But Americans aren't real fond of that, which is why yeah. what differentiates the Dirt Killer line from the Krenzel line, mm -hmm. when I say, well, we build the Dirt Killer line to be more of an American style pressure washer. See that, and yeah, it, I know. It looks, it looks like a Ford, or, you know, Ford pickup versus, you know, yeah. say some European style car where I, I want to see the mechanics. I want to see the muffler and you know, all that stuff. Yeah, but so, I want to, I like the fit and finish. Well, and that's, you know, it's all about preference, right? That's yeah. our, And that's part of the reason why like I chased going and create my own version of a pump or I could call it my own and all of that. But I fit and I can't be, it, these guys have been doing this for a hundred years, mm -hmm. you know? There's no beating them at their own game. Right. Well, and they're certainly not going to help you design it either. Yeah. The Germans are very elusive with their information. So it's important to point out that when you take the valve housing off of the transmission housing and expose the plunger set, that portions of the packing kit will often remain on the plungers, which has yeah. been a common issue from the time that I started rebuilding these, and especially since I started providing tech support, is that um, when reassembling, you have to make sure that all of your old parts mm -hmm. aren't still on the plungers. Okay. Or, you know, when we're, when we're walking through the, you know, water seals are called packings because it's a series of seals that are packed together like a sandwich. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you get all of the, all of the components off of the plungers. So normally I would leave these on until I take the transmission off, but not all of your customers are gonna remove them that way, so let's. So this is the seal kit? What is a seal kit? Well, the water seal kit does just that. It keeps the water inside the, the valve housing of the pump. 
It consists of two high pressure or a high pressure seal set and a low pressure seal set. So this outer, yeah. you know, these seals, your high pressure seals are still inside the valve housing. We haven't gotten to those yet. Okay. These are your low pressure seals right here. Got it. So, um, so when we're talking about a seal kit, we're not talking about any of these O-rings. No. We're talking about stuff inside the head. Yeah, your water seal kit or packing kit. Which is what we're digging into right now. Yeah, so here are your high pressure seals. They're a firmer seal. Okay. And then the low pressure seals are a soft seal. The high pressure seals also have a graphite coating on them, which is why we don't have to uh, lubricate anything as we reassemble. Okay. So. That's what it's going to look like. So when someone buys a seal kit, this is what we're talking about. Yep. And the nice thing about the Germans, uh, mo most of their repair kits come with a diagram that shows the order of the parts. Mm. And uh, there's As long as that. you can read German, yeah. Yep. Well, I am fluent in Google Translate. Yep. Got so it. says Stephen Strain. And actually, since in order to really show you the the benefit to the installation tool that we're going to use for the seals. We'll go ahead and put the new seal set in and just go ahead and replace these. Because since the, you know, we'll show in a minute, but the high pressure seal, because it's, uh, you know, we've got a cupped seal. If you were to take and cut this in half, it's you, it's got a U shape to mm -hmm. it. There's a, you know, a groove. The high pressure seal is like that as well. When that goes in, the cupped edge goes the direction, you know, goes into the pump and it's facing the direction of the fluid that it's trying to retain inside the housing. Okay. Okay. Because of that, there's the flared edge on the seals. The soft ones, you know, you can see it's squishy. Mm -hmm. it's, easy to, it's easy to manipulate them into the, the packing retainers but the high pressure seal is very difficult to get in there. There is a special tool that we're gonna to use to install them, mm. but um, it can be done without the tool, but it's tricky. And as a, as a result of that, a, lot, a common mistake is to install the seals in the wrong direction. Mm. So if you install the seals in the wrong direction, you're gonna get an instant water leak, mm -hmm. which is no bueno. So the U, faces right the cupped edge of the seal this of the way. water seal is facing this way mm -hmm. the same is true of the oil seal that's in the transmission housing it's a cupped seal and it's it's cupped edges facing that direction so this is the last shim or so what's oil. the what's the time frame on needing to replace these roughly uh how many hours yeah i believe the germans estimate approximately a thousand hours oh okay so for you know, ideal circumstances for, for, you know, homeowner, it could be the total life of the pressure washer. Uh, or, you know, from... Now, these come in contact with water, correct? Yes, sir. So if you have hard or nasty water, then that could affect the longevity of life. life True, life. and that's why I recommend the RV antifreeze because just like within the cooling system, you know, there's... Uh, you know, the chemical, chemical composition of the antifreeze helps to preserve the mm. seals. So, so you're taking your inlet hose and sticking it in a bucket of antifreeze and letting it self-prime and pull through. Yep. Just pull a whole and couple since of Kren, gallons through it. Since Kren, well, it, for this, going through the hose reel and everything, you only use about a half a gallon. Oh, okay. So it's a... Uh, and that'll clean all of this, lubricate your seals, It'd be a good practice if you're up north, mm -hmm. preps it for the winter. Oh, yep. That's genius, yeah, okay. And, and the other areas where it's the benefit <coughs> is uh, in your connections for your, our hoses over there, but you know how, you know, after a while, the, the end of the 22 millimeter connection mm -hmm. is not stainless steel mm. and hard water will cause them to rust out faster. So yeah. will DI water, yes. which is why um, if you're using DI water through the pressure washer, that's why it's so critical to flush it, flush it because DI water is hungry for minerals. And it leaches the pump, yeah. yeah. So if you let DI water sit in a, especially a brass head, it'll rust out. Right. I've found that I've been testing mine for nine years and it's still fine. Right. But, you know, if you're doing a high, you know, commercial application, you know, using DI water. 
Right. You're going to want to flush it. And, and you know, some, some of our customers run, you know, I explain to certain customers when they're like, well, I, I want to use it this way. Can I use, uh, for instance, is crabbers on a boat? Yeah. You know, they're using water in, you know, in Maryland, they're using water from the Chesapeake Bay to pressure wash while they're out in the bay. Shoot. And they usually have their pressure washer up on the, the roof of the, of the cabin. So they're having to suck salt water up yeah, they, they're 15 not, feet. Yeah, they're not pulling it all the way up there. Even, even with the Krenzler pump, it's not intended to pull that far. Because like I said, these are positive displacement pumps. They're not pumps that are intended for, for drawing water. Mm -hmm. So um, we usually recommend holding reservoirs. They can use their through hole fitting, yeah. pump up into the tank, and then just pull off of it. Yeah, you know, and either it does, slightly below it in a perfect application or next to it. Yeah, yeah. and and it doesn't even have to be gravity fed necessarily. Yeah, um, and that goes for both Krenzler pumps as well as all makes any of pumps. Self -priming, any self priming pump. Yeah. But the uh, you know some guys will insist that they've got to use one pump to pump up to their pressure washer pump, mm -hmm. and that can promote cavitation as well as you know your the supply pump isn't intended to pump to a restriction. Mm -hmm. And then once it starts to wear out to the point that it's not getting enough flow, you know, it starts to cavitate the pump because not enough flow is getting there. So, so triplex. Three, triplex. Three plungers. Three plungers. These so, things go, and we're going to show people the inside of yeah, this. Yeah, but you can, you know, this one, since it's nice and new, got still can get some rotation so you can see how as it spins, hmm. each one is, is pushing out at a different point. I'm gonna go tear um, mine apart when I get home. I can't wait. So we'll dive into this part first. So I'm so, gonna make you do it without any special tools. Show me the tool. Okay, well this is a special tool for removing the, the packings. Oh, it's just like a, uh, it's kind of like a um, uh, injector puller that we'd use to pull injectors out of a cylinder head. Yep. So, but like you said, I had to do this for a long time without special tools. How much is that special tool? A couple hundred bucks? Uh, no, that slide hammer was only uh, about a hundred bucks from Granger. Oh, okay. But, so, gently removing our packing retainers. And don't want to mar the brass. So there we have our packing retainers. Now below the packing retainers are the spacers, just like the spacers that were for the present with the low pressure seals. So wait, where was that underneath or on this, this side? This was facing this direction. So when okay. I pulled it out, the one was still stuck to the face. Okay. So on the packing retainers, they have little ports. These are leakage ports and uh, the, the head of the pump has them as well here. So do those here. have to line up when you reinstall? They don't have to, but, and uh, you know, here's a groove for the water, you know, if, if you were to have them askew of one another, mm -hmm. the fluid will still get there, but that's part of their design to help if the seals are starting to fail, you're gonna have that capillary action pulling water back in whenever the plunger pulls back. So that helps even if the seals start to wear out, uh, there we go, um, that's gonna help pull fluid back into the wet side of the pump mm -hmm. to help prevent the water from migrating into the oil bath. Hmm. So and around those packing retainers are some O-rings. Well, you can use some lubricant. You can still feel the lubricant on these. The lubricant I like to use is Vaseline. It's non-corrosive non-stinky and sticky and easy to wash off. So then, there's your high pressure seal. With the U, with the, the cup. U, yeah, the cup going in. And you can still still see some of the, the graphite lubricant mm. on the seal. Now, if you don't have a special tool, you can also just use a flat screwdriver. Try them out like so. And of course, when you're removing these, you're going to be replacing them. So doing that without damaging them isn't isn't critical. But and this side doesn't have. There's no 
um, O-ring inside of there. Like yeah, there's the no, side. this, uh, this little plastic part that goes underneath the cup on the low pressure seal is called a support ring. Mm -hmm. it's and it's not necessary that's not, for the, it's for the stiffer graphite type. Yep. So there we have it. That's so a, what is a symptom? So if these are bad, that's when you're, you start getting water in your oil. Water mm -hmm. in your oil and, and dripping underneath the pump right here at the six o'clock position of each one of the uh, plunger sleeves is a leakage port. The intent of the leakage port is to allow the water to migrate out of the pump as opposed to making it back to the oil housing. So when we have like on the KWS 700s, I've had dripping out the bottom. Mm -hmm. Is that because it wasn't torqued? The head wasn't torqued properly? The, the pump head wasn't on? Or is it because of that? Uh, it's is more it like a, maybe a seal wasn't seated properly? It could be that the seal isn't seated properly. Okay. Um, Krenzel seals are really good, you know, brand new out of the box. Some other brands of pumps, you actually have to run them a little while to get them hot and then allow them to cool down. Uh -huh. And that, uh, just the temperature change, the expansion that it takes place, helps to seat the, the water seals inside the pump. Hmm. <coughs> so. Okay, so because I've had um, like a KWS 165, remember the big, yep. it's the same pump as the, the, the 700, mm -hmm. the K165 STS, the one I have it at my house. Well, we, we did one at uh, the gentleman named Jim in Carolina, just an amazing garage we did. And uh, he had some drips and uh, we're like, oh shoot, we knew it was discontinued. Like we bought this pump a year in advance knowing that they were discontinuing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, oh shoot, this is the last one in existence. Um, is it possible that they ju we just needed to heat up, like it needed to cycle in the seals? Yeah, it might have just needed to be run and allow the seals to seat properly. Okay, so that could be a suggestion for people that have a slight drip. I've also noticed it on the first rounds of the, the, the um, 1322s, we got that drip right here at, at underneath here. Yep. So that's generally a seal-related seating issue. Right. And, and it's designed to do that to protect water from going into the transmission head. That's right. Now, of course, I like to tell everybody that a pressure washer that's running at its, you know, properly in an optimal setup, the only place that you should see water is coming out the tip of the nozzle. Yeah. So it's understandable that you buy the best pressure washer on the market. And you, you expect it to be perfect. Yeah. Right. So, and I, I have that expectation as well. Mm -hmm. So in the rare cases that we do get seals that fail right out of the box, I'm inclined to just replace the seals and usually with a brand new set when you'll you, get brand new you'll get a, a good dry no oper leak yeah, operation and it depends you know some people like if i get a pump personally mm -hmm. and it you know it needs to like i enjoy that chase but some people are you know much more hey i spent 1200 bucks on this thing mm -hmm. i don't want to do that well and, and, and i and understand both sides the mechanical know? Capability of the customer usually is also important. Yeah. Well, yeah. and yeah, if customers that want it to be right out of the box and don't want to have to work on it themselves don't want any leaks, and right. that's I, I completely respect that. Right. And we and we strive to get them the the best, you know, so that they don't have to yeah. deal with that. Well, and the the probability of that happening on a Krenzel is infinitely lower than it is on. And then on other other pumps. Yeah, because you're not they're not building millions and millions of them like yeah. you know, say a a, a box store pressure washer. Mm -hmm. So but here is those leakage ports in uh, the so valve you're, housing. So you're just poke and make sure nothing's jammed up in oh, there. Oh well yeah, just and also to so yeah, that you can show see me them. What, what they look like, yeah. Okay. So those are engineered that if the seals are wearing or worn or not seated properly, that the water will seep out the head of the pump rather than well, and back. Well, this is actually, uh, these are engineered. They go back into the supply channel oh. of the water going into the pump. They're, the expectation is that uh, capillary action will suck the water back in if mm. it's starting to make its way past the first, you know, the high pressure seal to, mm. to the low pressure seal and then beyond that. You know, it, it, we're, we're expecting that that's helping to get yeah. water back. So water's the not supposed to go that way. No. It's only supposed to go this way. Correct. So we've got those cleaned up. Wipe these down. 
So it would be standard practice that if you're going to do a seal kit and change these seals that you would clean everything nicely. Is there any anything you'd want to avoid, anything solvent based? You want to avoid using like gum out or carb cleaner or anything like that? I mean, as long as you have all the... I would avoid it if I was, you know, if, if the valves are still in there and, you know, if everything's still put together. I don't want that to get on any O-rings that are still present inside the pump. Mm -hmm. Now, a full rebuild here in our shop, I'll take the whole pump head and put it into our parts washer, uh -huh. which is a water uh, water-based parts washer um, and that that cleans it up nice it's also a heated parts washer so it gets gets everything nice and shiny hmm. but the, if you're at home nice rag yeah nice a rag a bit of time a little hmm. bit of time just wiping stuff down we've got them wiped down so the only parts from the seal kit that that are going to go back in are the packing retainers. Everything else in the seal kit will be new. Like I said, we're gonna use a brand new set of seals and I'll show you what the, the Krenzler tool looks like. So here we have the insertion tool. The Germans used to have ones that looked a little bit different. They've made them more ergonomic so it's easier to you know hold, get it into the place. Mm -hmm. And then also with this nifty little storage pin to keep the parts together. So this sleeve right here has a taper to it. So larger diameter on the insertion side and the end where it's gonna go out is machined so it sits down inside the cavity of the pump just so. And because that, that uh, channel going through there is tapered, it will take our flared edge of our high pressure seal. See how it's mm -hmm. got that flared edge. Mm -hmm. It's going to go in like so and it'll press it in so that it pops in real easy. And I'll demonstrate it with both methods. So I use a little Vaseline on here. Press the seal, and actually, usually I take the sleeve and get it lined up like that. And seal's now installed. Nice. And then after the high pressure seal, there's a little washer, a little rubber washer. Snaps down in place. And if the high pressure seal is installed correctly, the surface of this should be flush, flush with the little shoulder inside the, mm -hmm. the housing. Now I'll demonstrate it with the old school method. So nice clean flat tip screwdriver. Gonna start one side of the seal. coach it in there yeah once it gets started it'll slide right down in So I think any DIY dude in his garage is gonna have to do this like once in the lifetime with a pump, maybe, maybe right. twice. I mean, do they sell these? Is this a part? Number? Yes, sir. And so if but if I'm a detail shop and I've got two or three 1322s, yeah. Like if I was running like a high volume detail shop, I'd have three, you know, so I'd probably have, you know, let's say I had two, let's say I had one pump or one wash station, I'd probably buy another 1322 as a backup. Right. And that way I could just Swap rotate them. them out and then i'd buy i have all these tools so i could have my guys and teach them how to you know go watch this video series yeah. and go and swap them but otherwise that even if you weren't very mechanically inclined it'd probably take me twice as long take me five minutes ten minutes to get those in there yeah without the tool but the the important part here is that the cupped edge of the seal is going down into the housing. Mm -hmm. Like so. This makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. Gonna have fresh oil, fresh seals. Oh man, 
I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna buy this and do. I'm probably gonna make another video doing this all myself. <laughs> but I want all fancy tools, so I'm buying all the tools. Hey, that, I understand. The low pressure seals are much easier to install, and no special tools required. Now, this is a place where you don't need the lubrication to install it, but I put a little Vaseline on the cup edge of the seal to get the get the support ring to stay in place mm -hmm. and just slide them in like so. And then that ring goes there. You can also coat the, the washer to make it stay in place as well. And since we already got some Vaseline on our hands, a little bit on the O-rings. So the seal kit does give you a new O-ring. Yep. <clears throat> Might make sense to hang on to the old stuff just in case you need one in a pinch and you yeah. have a whole kit. Throw them in a bucket of parts. And then these snap in like so. Awesome. Like I said, the leakage ports don't have to line up when I'm feeling a little fancy and obsessed. And you'll try to line it, eyeball line it up. Yeah, yeah. On that thing. That was a four nine zero five three, and all the or no, excuse, yeah. Oh yeah, kit packing. So that's one hundred forty bucks. A new unloader valves ninety nine bucks. New gauge is seventy six bucks. What's a uh, one six four eight kit valve repair? That was the check valves. Okay, so that's 84 bucks. So there's your check valve kit. Comes oh, with 12 O-rings. And the, the O-rings that go underneath the check valves are the same ones okay, that so those are all the little green go around the, uh, the, the valve cap as well. Got it. Cool. So I'm going to have a whole suite of all this stuff in, in my store so you can don't have to call these guys. You can buy from me. And get me rich. <laughs> exactly. Off of, uh, off of twenty dollar parts. Mm -hmm.